And it's become kind of fashionable right now to be angry and to hate the church of Jesus. But I want you to understand that I still love the church. Now, I, you know, I, I've been leading in the church for 50 years and I've pretty much seen it all. And, you know, I have seen those who were not leading as they should, yet I still love the church. I mean, partly I love the church because look at this. Like, look at you. You're all here because of the church. You're here because of what God is doing in his church. In spite of all the other stuff. First of all, I love the church because Jesus loves the church. You, that's, you can't get around it. Jesus loves the church. Ephesians chapter five, we read that the church is the bride of Christ and that Jesus died and laid down his life to purify the church and present her holy and radiant. Now, my experience in life has been that if I hate somebody's wife, we're probably not gonna be very good friends. So it really makes no sense to say, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. That's not an actual option. You're either going to hate the whole thing and walk away from Jesus, or you're going to learn to love the church with all of its faults and pray for its purification. Why is judgment happening now? It's happening because God loves us. I don't know if you get that yet, but judgment comes because he loves us. He hasn't given up on us. He's removing the things that aren't right. He's pruning us. You know, we all, we all went through sort of an unprecedented event, a worldwide pandemic. And God pruned about 50% of the people out of our churches. And who did he prune? Those who were treating it like a commodity. They were consumers. They weren't family members. So we love the church because Jesus loves the church. We love the church because it's really the only place where lost people become disciples. There's no real discipleship outside the church. Like, you know, the things that we've been talking about, the, the things you just heard about, like the school and the college and, and the, you know, the relationships, the small groups in your churches. Those are all places of discipleship. It, that only happens inside the church. What good is it to lead lots of people to Jesus if none of them actually become disciples? Our mission is not make converts. Our mission is make disciples. I love the church because it's a training environment where gifts get recognized and servant leaders get developed. Here's what I want to say to you guys in your generation. You've seen some of the bad examples of people in my generation and how they led. The answer is not to say we won't lead. The answer is to like, just do it better. Like, just determine here and now you're going to lead with integrity 
you're not going to make up stories and exaggerate numbers. Decide right now you're going to be quick to tell the truth about your mistakes and your weaknesses. Why be quick? Well, number one, it kind of keeps people from turning you into a demigod. And besides which, God says his power is made perfect in weakness. So be quick to like admit your mistakes and admit your weaknesses. Determine that you're going to use whatever God gives you, whatever place he gives you, whatever leadership he gives you to help other people grow and prosper. Choose influence over power and money. They're, it's a different thing. Instead of trying to control people, try winning their hearts and minds. That's, that's it. Just do that. All of you, just do it. Find your place. Make a part. Make it better. Do it better. Certainly, if I were starting again, I would do it a little different than I did. But you get a chance to do it a little different than we did. You know, uh, I love the local church because it's the engine for mobilizing mission and resources. You know, there's a, there's a building over here. I, I don't know if you guys all noticed the building. There's a building over here, like an entire building, like a giant warehouse building over here, out of which ministry to the poor is happening. You know, and at home in, in my church, there's something like uh, a thousand families a month that are getting food through our church. That is possible because we do it together. Because we pool together our resources, our energy, our funds. We are able to do things to help our community, to help people in need that would never happen if we were just a scattered bunch of individuals. But by being gathered together in one family, under one purpose, we are able to do amazing things. I love the church because it's a family that shares all the joys and the trials of life together. You know, in 50 years, we went through a lot of life together. We've celebrated joys together, the births of children, their victories, their graduations, their marriages. We've also buried quite a few people, stood by people as they've gone through hard times. We've been through, I don't know how many different recessions in that time period. We've put up with all kinds of shenanigans from American politicians. Now I'm starting to go off the rails. So we'll go, we'll pull this, forget that. <laughs> the point is we've done it together and the joys are better together and the hard parts are lighter together. The big thing is, don't run the first time it gets a little uncomfortable. You know, the thing is, Jesus just keeps bringing just any old body into the church. He's like this father who keeps finding new children. He just brings them home. And he's not very picky, actually. <laughs> and... My experience is he likes to find somebody that's annoying to me and put them right next to me. <laughs> and says, learn how to love this one. <laughs> Where else in life does that happen? Right? Getting together in a living room with a bunch of your friends, that is not church because you're not suffering enough. <laughs> Ch 
churches when there's a bunch of messy people there. And you gotta learn to love them and you gotta spend, you know, get down on your hands and knees and heal them and cast out their demons and pray with them for a job and, you know, help, help them find a place to, and, you know, and all the stuff that goes with it, you're like in it. That's church. Yeah? No other place does that happen. And most importantly, the church is a fireplace where the fire of the Spirit can work in life-changing ways. You know, uh, for most of the years of our life, we've had to have Kleenex boxes scattered all over the gathering room, the room where we meet, because people walk in the door and they find themselves crying from the first Sunday. They walk in and they start crying. And usually it's at least six months to a year that they cry every Sunday. So we have to have a lot of those tissue boxes all over the place. I see they've got some here. Why? Because they come in and they feel the presence of God. And their heart finds itself coming home. And they cry. If you ask them, why are you crying? They won't be able to tell you. I don't know. <laughs> but it's their heart coming home to the only true home any of us have, and that is the presence of the Lord. It's in the church that that's happened. It's in the church that that happens. That's why it's so important that the church should be consciously, deliberately supernatural, constantly seeking his presence because it doesn't happen anywhere else. I remember one dad came to check us out because his daughter had been indicted to a sleepover on a Saturday night. And the way the sleepover instructions were, were you could come early on Sunday and pick your child up, or you can come much later, but we'll take your child with us as we go to church. Well, he thought, what could go wrong? So we're going to come late and let, the, let them take the girl to church. Well, she came and liked it and said, can I come back? And so she came back and she came back several weeks. And one day she comes home and tells her dad, I think I'm starting to believe this Jesus stuff. <laughs> then he got worried. So he turns up to check these things out. And I met him on the first Sunday and he comes up to me and he squints his eyes. And he says, I don't know what's going on in this place, but there's something powerful here and I'm going to find out what it is. <laughs> and I walked away laughing, thinking, you sure are. <laughs> Three weeks later, there's some people, you know, the service has been over for a bit. And there's a few people scattered around the front, and they're praying for this one person who's getting healed. And this person's trembling just slightly, like just barely enough to see. They're just shaking just a little bit, pretty well. It's nothing real dramatic for our taste. You know, they're not flopping. They're not screaming. They're, not, they're just shaking a little bit while they're praying for them. And he's standing at the, by the back door, and he's looking at that, watching. So I go over there, and he says, what's going on up there? Why, why is that person shaking? I says, well, I think they're probably praying for healing. And I think that person's shaking because there's healing power going through their body. He says, oh. I says, you want to look a little more closer? We, we can get a little closer. So he says, okay, yeah, yeah I, I would like to get a little closer. So he comes up with me. We get about 20 feet away, and we're standing there watching, and his hand starts shaking. He's standing like this. And I'm looking, I see his hands shaking. 
I said, what's going on? My hand is shaking. <laughs> and I can't stop it. And I'm thinking, gotcha. <laughs> he says, why is my hand shaking? I said, well, maybe God wants to use your hands to help heal that person. Why don't we get a little closer and you can touch them? <laughs> you know where this is going. <laughs> he touches that person and he, now his whole body's shaking. Before that day was over, he prayed for healing for three people. Only in the church did that kind of stuff happen. Yeah? So that's why I love the church. You know, uh, I just want to encourage you, you know, the scriptures tells us, you know, we come together and he says, you know, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive one another, the scripture tells us. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. You know what that basically means? You're going to have something you have to bear with. <laughs> You're going to have to have something that you are going to have to forgive. It's not going to be perfect. You know, in fact, you know, I used to at the members, the new members class, we had new members class, classes for new members. We'd always say, the one thing I can guarantee you is that if you stay as part of this church family, somewhere down the line, somebody's gonna hurt you. Because I'm pretty sure we got people here, not angels. And not only that, but they're like people from a whole bunch of different cultures. In our church, we're, we've got people from 55 nations of the world. We've got so many different cultures going, you can't keep up. So you got all of that going on as well. It's very easy to kind of end up, you know, not understanding each other. And then it was just like, and it's all about what we do with it when it happens. Like we learn to talk it out. We learn to forgive, we learn to bear with, we learn to listen, and we learn to humble ourselves and serve one another, and that makes us a church that God can bless. And so my challenge is very simply this. Don't let the scumbags control your destiny. Can I make it any more clear? Don't let the scumbags control your destiny. Well, I know there's some. God's exposing them. He's removing them. Don't let them control your destiny. Get in a church. Be a part of it. Make it better. Make it real. Be a servant. Show what servant leadership really can be. God will do great things. He'll do great things in your life. Unbelievable things. I'm just in the, my wife is home now, proofreading a little book I wrote for my grandchildren, which I'm calling Granddad's Book of Miracles. It's nothing but the miracles I've seen. I want them to know what I've, what happened to me. I want them to know what I've seen. You can have your own book of miracles. Just get in, get involved, get in, the, get in the trenches, start trying, start serving, 
and you'll get your own book of miracles for your grandkids.